So it's uh, my great pleasure um, to introduce our, our first speaker, who's going to give us a sense of, um, of wildfires and, um, and what's happening in, in Canada, um, where are we at in terms of um, the scope of the problem, and a little bit of a look um, towards the future. So um, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Piyush Jain from Natural Resources Canada, who will um, tell us about the changing wildfire season in Canada. Piyush. Oh, hi everyone, good morning. Uh, yeah, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk to you about fires in Canada and how uh, fire seasons are changing um, and how we anticipate they will change. Uh, so my talk is, uh, I'm going to give a bit of an overview at the beginning about what we know about wildfires in Canada. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the 2023 fire season, which I think really brought uh, this into clear focus, this issue of wildfire smoke. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about what we can expect uh, in the future under a warming climate uh, and finish up a little bit with a little bit about fire management if I have time. So, uh, yeah, let me just get right in there. There we go. So, uh, one thing that fire scientists like are triangles. Uh, so, on the, this is sort of the components that go into wildfires from at different scales. Uh, on the bottom, we're talking about uh, temporal scales, so going from seconds to centuries. Uh, and on the vertical scale, we're talking about the space, so going from you know, the scale of, of combustion itself all the way up to like landscape scale, so the, the countrywide. So the bottom left triangle is just called the fire triangle. Um, so the three components that you need for a fire, and I think everyone who's tried to lamp a, light a campfire knows this, is oxygen, heat, and fuel. Um, but at the level of a wildfire, uh, the components that we usually talk about are fuel, so the vegetation on the ground, trees or shrubs, or, or even just litter ground fuels, uh, topography, um, and weather, of course. So weather plays a big role. Um, and in fact, extreme fire weather, so when it's hot, dry and windy, that's when we expect a fire to grow um, and, and spread quickly. Um, and at the larger scale, when we want to talk about you know, long-term changes in fire, um, we talk about wildfire regimes. So this is the fire regime triangle. And so there we talk about climate, we talk about ignition regimes, so human or lightning caused light, um, ignitions, and we talk about vegetation. And there may be, long term, there may be changes in vegetation as well due to climate uh, interactions. So Canada has 362 million hectares of forest. And it's the third most forested country in the world behind Brazil and Russia. Uh, most of that forested region, you can see in the, the green uh, band, I guess, that goes from the west to the east is um, boreal forest. So boreal forest is dominated by um, coniferous forests, so conifers, and they burn uh, at a very high intensity um, and they uh, fire spread very quickly in those, in those uh, types of forests. So some general facts about fire. Well, uh, we have about 8,000 fires a year. Um, and about 2.1 million hectares burn on average. Um, so we have very, very large year-to-year -year variability in area burned. That's because fire is a product of those different components. We have, you know, fire, weather, ignitions. They may not, you know, we may have ignition, potential ignitions at a time when the fire weather isn't extreme or vice versa. And so um, that leads to a very episodic um, fire regime or um, area burned each year. Uh, we talk about the fact that the tail wags a dog, so 3% of the largest fires are responsible for 97% of the area burned. Um, and I mentioned that the boreal forest is dominated by coniferous forests or conifers. Um, and the reason this is important is because those uh, fires can go from ground to surface to crown, so that's the, the bottom right plot there. Um, and those crown fires burn at very, very high intensity. And in fact, when those fires get large, they're very hard to put out. Um, on average, $1 billion is spent uh, nationwide every year on fighting fires, approximately. And ob obviously, years like 2023, uh, they, more was spent than that. So 
Um, just a brief discussion about ignitions. So approximately half the ignitions are lightning caused and half are, are human caused. But of those lightning caused fires, they're responsible for about 90% of the area burned. Um, and the reason for that, of course, is because those fires tend to occur further away from communities and can become larger, whereas those fires, um, those human caused fires that you see in red uh, on that map uh, tend to be close to, uh, close to where people live, obviously, and they're discovered more quickly, and there are also fire suppression is uh, enacted um, on those fires to try to put them out completely so that they don't um, you know, threaten communities. Um, the seasonality of lightning and human caused fires are different. You can see on the bottom left plot there, uh, we tend to start off with lightning caused fires in the spring when the fuels are dry before vegetation greens up. Um, but in summer is dominated by those lightning fires uh, when we have more lightning activity. Uh, and of course, you know, not all fire is bad. Fire is a natural part um, of ecosystems, the boreal ecosystem in particular, um, and in fact is a natural part of many North American ecosystems. So the forests are actually fire adapted. They need the heat of fire to release the cones and for those cones to release their seeds and for regeneration of forests. And there's a bunch of other, uh, you know, I'm not a fire ecologist, so my, my uh my knowledge is a little bit superficial on this point, but you know, they're, they're, the, uh, there's nutrient cycling and uh, benefits to the carbon, carbon cycle in general of having um, uh, of frequent fires. Um, so what do we know looking at the data of the last few decades of, uh, of how fire is changing in Canada? Uh, so the area has been bur uh, area burned annually has been increasing since 1959. 1959 is sort of our cutoff for where we believe we have good fire data. I mean, obviously we have data going back further, but um, the reporting was not as consistent before 1959. Um, and during that time, the mean fire season has increased by 19 days. So we know this. We know fire seasons are getting longer. Um, Alberta just declared in February, you know, that they were starting their fire season. So. Um, or at least preparedness for the fire season. So, so interestingly, the number of lightning caused fires are increasing, but the number of uh, human caused fires are actually decreasing. Um, and that's for whatever reasons, um, maybe efficiencies in, in, uh, in fire management, or people are just getting better at, at not starting fires. And when most human caused fires, I should note, are unintentional, just through activity on the landscape. So, of course, um, I have to talk about the 2023 fire season um, because of how exceptional and record-breaking it was. Um, if you want to find out more information, we just put a preprint online. Um, that's the URL, URL, or you can email me later and I can send you a copy. Um, so, 15 million hectares burned in 2023. Um, and this was seven times the national average, which is about 2.1 million hectares, and more than double the previous record, which occurred in 1989. Um, of our provinces and territories, four, Quebec, Northwest Territories, Alberta and British Columbia, all had record-breaking fire seasons. Uh, and other, fire, other um, provinces and territories had well above average amount of fire burning. So it really was an exceptional year in terms of the scope um, and the scale of the area burned um, from coast to coast, in fact. Uh, this slide takes a bit longer to load. There we go. So this is a map of, um, of where all the fires burned in Canada in 2023. Uh, so you can see that most of the burning occurred in Western Canada and in Quebec. Um, and in fact, a real story of 2023 was that uh, even though so much area burned, it was actually a little bit below average in terms of the number of fires. So the typical number of fires I, I showed earlier is about 8,000. In 2023, we had 6,700 fires. So it was a little bit below average, but the real story is those fires burned over a really long time, and a lot of them uh, became very large. So in fact, fifth, 20, the top 20 uh, largest fires, which are shown there, were responsible for 50% of the area burned in 2023. And in fact, 
the five largest fires, including one fire of over a million hectares, um, were responsible for about 25% of the area burned. So just five fires were responsible for a quarter of the area burned in 2023. Of course, uh, it's why we're all here today, to talk about the impacts of the 2023 fire season. Um, so there were over 200 individual evacuations uh, due to wildfire, um, either direct threats to communities or wildfire smoke. Um, and in the end, 232,000 people approximately were evacuated. So that's far above any other year in the record that we have there uh, from data going back to 1980. Um, just a reminder that Fort McMurray um, in, in uh, 2016 was the largest single event where we had 88,000 people evacuated the entire town. Um, I'm not going to say much about air quality because uh, Dan's got that covered after me and many other talks I'm sure but uh, I just mentioned very briefly that there were more air quality alerts issued in 2023 and there's a map of the Environment Canada alerts um, than any other year in, in recent history, probably any other year that we have records for including 1,400 air quality alerts in June alone. Um, and then, of course, fire management was severely constrained. So uh, the Centre for... Um, what's the acronym? The Centre for Forest, Fi the Forest Fire Interagency... Uh, I've got the acronym wrong, but... Uh, the agency that determines uh, the preparedness level at national scale... Um, for sharing resources between provinces and internationally. They set the highest level of five in May, on May 11th. So that's the earliest we've ever gone to level five, and we stayed at level five for 120 days. Uh, and with that came a lot of international resource sharing. So we had over 5,500 firefighting personnel from 12 countries in the EU um, deployed to Canada. So it was exceptionally uh, challenging in terms of and fire uh, suppression. Um, so what are some of the drivers of the 2023 fire season? I'll just briefly mention these. Um, the preprint I mentioned goes into detail a lot more. Uh, well, we had low snowpack in the 22-23 uh, winter, which meant we had early snow melt. So that m map in the middle uh, shows uh, the departure from normal, so how much earlier or later the snow melt was. And you can see across many of these, those areas where we had those large fires, it was very early snow melt. And then we had rapid trend, we had uh, severe drought conditions in May across Western Canada, and then we had a rapid transition to drought conditions in Eastern Canada. And that includes, although it's not reflected in this map so clearly, that includes Nova Scotia that of course had um, some large fire events in May. Um, and the final piece of the puzzle uh, in terms of weather and climate were extreme fire weather conditions. So I won't go into the details, but basically this shows you, this uh, time series shows you on the right, uh, the proportion of the country, of the forested area of Canada that was experiencing extreme fire weather conditions on any day of the year. Um, and the red curve is the normal uh, average uh, from 1991 to 2020. So you can see early, like in May and June, uh, the country was under very severe extreme fire weather conditions. Uh, and in fact, there was a period in May where over a third of the forested area of Canada had uh, extreme fire weather conditions. How am I going for time? Sorry. I'm good? Okay. I don't need to rush too much. Okay, so, I mean, overall, the factor which is... Uh, uh, similar on all of those uh, previous um, individual factors I showed was that 2023 was very hot and very dry. Um, globally, is now being established that 2023 was the hottest year on record. Um, and in fact, uh, scientists at the European Centre for Medium Range Forecasting have said probably it's the hottest year in the last 125,000 years. Um, so it was 0 0.6 degrees warmer than the normal uh, period, which we take to be 1991 to 2020. 1.48 degrees warmer than the 1850 to 1900 pre-industrial level. So the reason that is interesting is we are very close already. If you just take 2023 uh, in Canada, we're very close to the uh, 1.5 degrees of warming that they talk about, right? That the Paris Accord is trying to restrict ourselves to. Um, 
But during the 2023 fire season, Canada was even hotter than that. It was 2.2 degrees warmer than the 1991 to 2020 average. So Canada in particular, when you look at the global anomalies, was very hot. So those maps show the temperature anomalies on the left and then the ranking on the right. So that is the ranking from 1940 uh, to 2023 of the 2023 mean temperature across the fire season. So you can see over much of Canada, it was the, the hottest between May and October um, since it's been since 1940. And that really set up all those conditions I showed on the previous slide and enabled a, a very extreme fire season. Which begs the question, what role did climate change play in the 2023 fire season? And in changing um, fire regimes in Canada in general. So, um, I don't know why that, uh, that particular picture rotated. It was okay on my... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, you can crane your head. Uh, so it's been well known since the 1800s that the basic physics uh, that um, leads to climate, um, the basic physics, I guess, of, of global warming has been known since the 1800s. Essentially, the idea that increased CO2 uh, will increase the temperature of, of, uh, of the atmosphere. Um, so that's been known for well over 100 years. Um, and we've been measuring CO2 levels uh, since mid-century. So that um, plot on the top right are the CO2 levels at Moana Loa, which is an observatory in Hawaii. Uh, it has the longest continuous record since 1958. And that shows that the CO2 uh, concentrations have been increasing since 1958 and are now at about 423 parts per million. Uh, so it's increased about 50% um, over the time that they started monitoring um, that. And what goes with that increased CO2 uh, increases in the global mean temperature, which is shown on the bottom right. So, in fact, you can see where it lands at 2023, that 2023 was the hottest year on record, as I already mentioned, but over many months of the year, particularly uh, from about June to December, each of those months was also the hottest month on record. So what does a warming climate mean for fire? Oh, how do I go back on this one? Okay, so we talked about extreme fire weather briefly before, and I won't go into too much around what these individual values are. So they're, um, the top two are based on this, the Canadian Fire Weather Index system, um, which is a system that we use to establish fire danger based on weather in Canada. Uh, it's used for research, but it's also used operationally. And the bottom one is the vapour pressure deficit. So that's how dry the atmosphere is. But essentially, you see, when you look at the global uh, anomalies of those three metrics, of extreme values of those metrics, they're all increasing. Uh, and there's been a very consistent trend over the last 40 years or so. Um, those bars are coloured as well by um, the global land surface temperature. So. You can see that the, that warming uh, that also goes hand in hand with the extreme fire weather conditions. Uh, when we look at just the vapor pressure deficit on the right hand plot, trends across, Canada, uh, across North America, we see there are positive trends over most of the continent. Um, so extreme fire weather conditions are increasing, and that is driving some of our uh, observed fire weather, uh, some of our observed increases in fire season activity. I just want to highlight very quickly a couple of papers. Um, uh, so one which has now linked climate change to um, increased area burned and other aspects of fire regimes in Alberta. And another recent uh, paper which also links climate change to increased fire activity uh, since the mid-2000s in British Columbia. So those connections have been made. Um, and, you know, and then there's been a developing uh, field of science called climate attribution where they're trying to make these, uh, these connections more formal. So can we actually attribute, for example, increased area burned to, um, to climate change? So the way uh, these 
this method works essentially is that uh, we have two models. So we have a model of the world that we live in, so a model with the amount of carbon dioxide that we currently have in the atmosphere, and then we have what we call a counterfactual model, which is we pretend we roll back the clock to pre-industrial levels of CO2 and we look at what sort of weather events or the probability of having different weather events in that counterfactual world would be. And then we compare the relative probabilities. So in this example, the probability of having an event magnitude, let's just say it's a, a temperature of, of 39.6 degrees, which is what Lytton got in 2021, for example, that record-breaking temperature. Let's pretend it's that. Then you can look at what is the probability of having that event in our observed world, and what was the probability of having that event in a counterfactual world. And in these, this example, the probability of the event in the observed world might be one-fifth, and in the counterfactual world might be one-sixtieth. So then we would say, if you divide the one-fifth by the one-sixtieth, we'd say there's a 12 times uh, climate change made that observed extreme 12 times more likely under. So that, that's a statement that we can make based on this methodology. In terms of how it's been applied to fire, um, well, there's a couple of studies I'd like to highlight. It's still an emerging science, as I, as I mentioned. So there's one study from California, uh, and they concluded that no, nearly all of the area burned increases in California since 1971 can be attributed, attributed directly to anthropogenic climate change. And then many of you may be aware of this rapid study that came out uh, Quebec in 2023, um, they came to two conclusions. So when they looked over the entire fire season, how severe the fire weather conditions were, they concluded it was seven times more likely due to climate change. And when they looked at just the fire, the most, the period of the most extreme fire weather that occurred during that fire season, they, they concluded that it was twice as likely under climate change. So climate change has been uh, attributed or anthropogenic climate change in particular, has been attributed to these increases in extreme fire weather conditions and to area burned. So what does the future hold? Well, uh, looking at this report from 2019, Canada's Changing Climate Report, it's put out by Environment Canada, um, you can look at the projections of temperature. Uh, so what's shown there is in the red is uh, what's called the RCP 8.5 scenario. So that's business as usual. If emissions continue to increase um, without any uh, attempts to curtail the amount of emissions that we're putting into the atmosphere. And the, the blue curve is uh, RCP 2.6, which is uh, actually a, a fairly aggressive reduction in CO2 emissions. So you can see under both scenarios we will see warming, but clearly under the higher emission scenario we see a lot more warming, in fact in excess of five or six degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Um, but we also see an increase in precipitation uh, of, of greater than 20% under that higher emission scenario. So you might ask the question, well, if precipitation is increasing and, and temperatures are both increasing together, do, do we actually get more extreme fire weather in the future because we'll have more rainfall under uh, as well to compensate for those higher temperatures. Well, a study in 2016 did conclude that, in fact, we would need 15% more uh, precipitation for every degree of warming to compensate for the increased warming, and that is not occurring, and the models do not show that as uh, what's going to occur. So there is not enough precipitation to compensate for the increases in temperature and the drying that comes with that under a warming climate. Uh, so there are a few studies I will just briefly highlight um, that have tried to project future area burned under climate change. Uh, so the two studies at the top, um, one from 20, 2005 and one from 2014, concluded that there was uh, the area burned by the end of the century under the business as usual scenario of increased emissions will increase two to four times. Um, and a more recent study that, uh, on the bottom there from 2022 actually concluded that if you take all the scenarios and average over them, by the end of the century we'll have four times as much area burned. But in fact, if you just look at that higher emissions, uh, higher emissions um, scenario, we will have seven times the area burned by the end of the century. Um, 
So, and that seven uh, is is very close to the number of how much bigger the 2023 fire season was, just through coincidence. Um, so another way we can look at the potential role of climate change is to actually look way back in the past to the mid-Pliocene. Uh, so a colleague of mine does paleoclimate studies around fire. Um, so this study area that we're highlighting is in Ellesmere Island, which is way up in the, the Canadian archipelago uh, islands, which are up north. Uh, and this study site is called the Beaver Pond Study Site. So it was uh, about two to three million years ago, the mean summer temperatures at this spot were about 15.4 degrees Celsius. And the current temperatures at a, at a point nearby are about 4.1 degrees. So, um, but the interesting thing is, is that the modern CO2 concentration, which is about 423 parts per million, is very close to what the carbon concentrations were back two to three million years ago. So, you know, uh, it is sort of a harbinger for the future, possibly. Um, if we're, you know, there is, a, there is a lag in the climate system. It takes time to catch up. It can take, uh, no one knows how long it would take to equilibrate to those conditions. But it sort of does at least tell us which direction we're moving in. Um, so I just my last slide, I just want to very, very briefly mention possibly what we can do about managing fire in a warming climate. Uh, and in fact, there are many things that can be done to protect communities, including the Fire Smart program, you know, uh, making our buildings safer, uh, more resistant to fire, clearing fuels from around our properties and so forth. Um, but on a landscape scale, here's a couple of examples I just want to briefly mention. So one is this idea of prescribed burning, which you've probably all heard of, um, fighting fire with fire. So the idea is that you set fires uh, intentionally, but when the fire weather conditions are not extreme, with the idea that you will have low to moderate intensity fires that will remove some of that lower, um, so the surface fuels or the ground fuels, um, and even the ladder fuels, which are the, the branches as you, as, uh, or the lower branches of trees, so that when extreme fire weather conditions do come along, there is less fuel to consume, and that fire won't get those fires won't get as big. Uh, so there's an example of that on the left, uh, which was applied by First Nations in BC. Um, and another idea, which has been applied in the Yukon, is this idea of building a permanent fire break. So they cleared 365 uh, hectares of forest but then they planted um, aspen. And aspen is a more fire-resistant uh, species than, than many conifers, it's a deciduous tree. Um, and so the idea is by replacing those more flammable trees by a more fire-resistant species, it will create a natural fuel break. Um, and that can be, you know, this is, these, both of these things are expensive uh, and time-consuming to implement, but if they work, um, they may be much cheaper than the consequences of, of paying the price for uh, increased fire activity or direct threats to communities, of course. So I will just leave it there, uh, and thank you for your attention. Thanks. So those of you who have been here before know the drill. Um, after every speaker, we ask you to stand up, give them a standing ovation for an excellent talk. Um, also give you an opportunity to stretch. Um, those of you online, I encourage you to do the same. Um, get up from wherever you are and, and have a bit of a stretch. Um, so thanks very much, uh, Piyush. We, we'll take um, a couple questions. We, got to, we have a little bit of time. Um, I'm not sure if they're roving microphones or not. Um, otherwise, shout. There's a mic back there. Um, so questions? Sarah. You have a loud voice, so I go ahead. <laughs> Thank you, Piyush. I just want to make a plug for the preprint that Piyush had a link to. I took three hours to read it very carefully Saturday morning, and it was an excellent use of three hours of my Saturday morning time. It really is a wonderful, in-depth review of the season. And I just wanted to point out one thing that you didn't mention that I took away from the paper, which is in normal seasons, we kind of like usually have fires in the west or fires in the east.
and this season we had fires right across the country. And my understanding was that was like, that you'd never really seen that before. And you kind of caught it in your first slide with the breakup, and I'm just wondering if you could comment on that a bit more. No, there was, there was a surprising aspect of the 2023 fire season. So, um, fire, as I mentioned, is highly episodic. Uh, you know, we have these big years and we have these small years, and it's often driven by these large-scale weather patterns. So, um, you know, the fact that we have, you can have a heat wave, and that will maybe dominate the conditions on one side of the country, whereas on the other side of the country, we may actually have the opposite, right? So that quite often happens in Canada, where, you know, Western Canada, for example, like the 2021 Pacific Northwest heat wave, right? So extreme conditions over Western Canada, but not extreme at all in the east because you have the kind of opposite weather pattern occurring. Um, so we tend to get this kind of asynchronous behavior occurring. But in 2023, it was it's sort of those weather, those extreme weather conditions moved from the west to the east and back to the west and back to the east and continued to like dry out the fuels in the forests um, and really enabled a lot of area burned in both, on both sides of the country, so. Sure. What are you seeing for summer 2024? Ah, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we can just look at the current conditions and we can look at the models. So the current conditions uh, basically point to the fact that Western Canada, particularly BC and Alberta, are still very much in drought-like conditions. Um, everyone's aware of that, I'm sure. Um, snowpack was very low. Um, but Eastern Canada, Quebec, I mean, I think they just got a foot of snow. Um, yeah, they've kind of come out of those drought conditions. Um, but of course, they could very quickly enter those drought conditions again. And then the models going forward, the, um, the seasonal forecast for temperature and precipitation show that temperatures are going to be above average going into spring, uh, spring into summer, um, and precipitation will be about the same. So, But there's a lot of uncertainty in those and those uh, forecasts. So. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm curious if you can comment on sort of the concept of holdover fires or these so-called zombie fires and, and whether if we're starting to see these larger fires develop in a changing climate, how that might change our fire season lights and what we need to do to prepare potentially the spring or the start. Yeah, so, I mean, these fires are pretty well monitored. I mean, you're right, uh, this particular fire season has been exceptional in that uh, there's been a, over 100 holdover fires, uh, particularly in Alberta, I think, and BC and in Northwest Territories. So, um, yeah, these fires continue to be monitored. Um, it, so the, they tend to not spread, but they tend to just smolder and may produce smoke. Not not enough smoke. I think that it's a, a you know a worry at a community level, you know, in terms of but still uh, of concern because when spring comes and the fire weather conditions enable growth, those fires might start to grow again. So um, I think given the number of fires, like usually holdover fires are not a concern uh, because uh, they tend to. A, there tend to not be that many of them for a start, the overwinter. Um, and then those fires may not grow in the spring, right? It depends on what happens in the spring. There may be, once the snow's gone, there may be rainfall and so forth. So I think there's a lot of uncertainty this year, though, given how many of them there are. So I think they're being closely monitored. I, yeah. Um, I guess as fire seasons get longer in the future, we will expect to see more of them. Um, so maybe 2023 is, is a a view of the future there, so. Thanks, I think we better move on. Um, sure. Just on behalf of the organizing committee. Oh, um, thank you. Small token of appreciation. Thanks very much appreciate for a really it. excellent talk. Yeah. Um, thanks. thanks.